Now on this last tape, we're just going to go at random here and kind of go over what we've studied. We've come a long way since our beginning. We're going to give you some illustrations just from observations down through the years, make some more comments, and then draw some conclusions and draw this study to a close. If there's any doubt in your mind about what we've said, go back and play the tapes again. And remember to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you'll come to this study and to the word of God with an open mind and a believing heart and saying, Dear God, if you'll show me something out of your word, I'll, I'll try to accept it, then you won't have any trouble finding the truth. I don't believe God wants to hide the truth from anybody if they really, really, and honestly, and sincerely want it. But don't ask amiss. Uh, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Well, there's a lot of arguments and a lot of, of um, opposition, and, and there's a lot of things we haven't been able to cover. There's all kinds of different cases about... Uh, grounds and things like that and it'd be impossible uh, to be able to cover everything but what we just got through studying about 1st Timothy chapter 3 about a bishop being the husband of one wife we showed you that uh, it was dealing with bigamy no doubt because they, we gave some quotes from the expositors Greek Testament to show that even in the early church they was referring to it as bigamy and we also showed you how that God himself uh, and the in the in the scriptures in, Deut in Deuteronomy 24 and Matthew 19 recognized, and also the Jewish law courts and the Greek law courts recognized a divorced scripturally and remarried man as the husband of one wife. And um, we have run into it uh, over the teaching about the divorce but no remarriage doctrine. And uh, this doctrine teaches that in certain cases it's okay to be get a divorce, but you can never remarry again. It has no proof for its teaching. It's loaded with presumption and cannot hold ground when it's put to the test of proven facts. There is nothing in its claims that constitutes a basic of proof. It violates all sound rules of interpretation. And if the same method were applied to other doctrines, one could make the Bible mean anything. It's a doctrine of inconsistency. Uh, some deno denomination that believe this doctrine will not allow their minister or preachers to perform a marriage for anyone who's divorced, but then turn right around and receive them into their church when the minister of another denomination officiates. Well, um, <clears throat> I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things going on these days, and it's hard to realize what the motive is for a lot of these things. But um, nevertheless, you don't have to worry about it if you stand upon the Word of God. We rest our case as we begin this last tape on the thought a biblical, scriptural, legal divorce dissolves marriage. And uh, that, that can be proved when all the facts uh, are in, of an interpretation are in agreement. They sound together like a harmony, like a choir singing with all the parts. No scripture is out of place. It's one of the established principles of law in England and in America that a law means exactly what it says and is to be interpreted and enforced exactly as it reads. Now, us preachers and Bible teachers would would do ourselves and our congregation a favor if we'd take a little advice from the law courts. Let me give you that again. It's one of the most firmly established principles of law in England and in America that a law means exactly what it says and is to be interpreted and enforced exactly as it reads. Now, if you have to change the Bible to make it say what you're, you believe, or if you have to twist the scriptures to agree with your doctrine, or if you have to give words in the scriptures meaning that the scripture don't give them in order to teach your doctrine, or if you have to add words to the verse that's not in the verse to get it to teach your doctrine, 
there's something wrong with your doctrine, friend. You need to adjust your doctrine to fit the book and quit adjusting the book to fit your doctrine. I guess what it boils down to is you really believe the book as it stands or, or you just believe the parts you like and twist the other parts to agree with what you think. And you, you should never violate the known usage of a word and invent another word, uh, usage or definition, for which there is no precedent. Uh, for example, like is done on fornication there in Matthew chapter number 19. You hear a lot of talk today, especially among the stronger independent Baptist preachers, that uh, the fact that Matthew records the fornication exception and Mark and Luke doesn't proves that he was only talking to Jews and no one else was included in his word. Now, as I said before, before I am a dispensationalist. I believe uh, that Matthew primarily, doctrinally, is speaking to the Jewish nation. I believe that. But I don't believe that all the morals and all the rights and wrongs in Matthew are just to the Jews. Now, John don't mention either one. Does that mean Mark and Luke aren't right? Does that mean Mark and Luke aren't to Gentiles since John doesn't mention it the way that John doesn't mention either side of the divorce issue? When you start thinking about uh, the Gospels, the Gospels cannot contradict each other. Each one of the four evangelists records some words and actions of the Lord which are just peculiar to that particular gospel. Matthew preserves whole groups of special instructions and events that are not in the other gospel. Uh, one gospel without the other three would be uh, really hard to figure out sometimes if it weren't for the testimony and the uh, harmony of the other three gospels. There are... Um, uh, paragraphs that are in Matthew that as the pulpit commentary says not less than 62 in Matthew that are not contained in the other gospel and you need to realize that the plain reconciliation of passages on this divorce issue must be found in the principle that an exception in a fuller account must explain a briefer account Mark and Luke might naturally take this for granted without expressing it. The scriptural doctrine of divorce is very simple. It's contained in Matthew 19. I'm quoting the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia now, published in, by Erdman's in 1952, volume 2, page 865. The scripture doctrine of divorce is very simple. It is contained in Matthew 19, 3 to 12. In Matthew, we have the fullest report containing everything that is reported elsewhere and one or two important observations that the other writers have not included. Luke has but one verse where Matthew has ten. Luke's verse is in no uh, necessarily connected with the context. We seem to be justified then in saying that the total doctrine of the scripture pertaining to divorce is contained in Matthew 19. This is the issue so plainly stated that the wayfaring man need not err therein. The gospel should be viewed together, of course. And listen to this. To interpret and reconcile laws so that they harmonize is the best code of construction. In other words, they don't contradict. They harmonize if you read them right. Matthew's Sermon on the Mount has 111 verses. Luke's has 29. Now, uh, wouldn't be much be lacking if all you had was Luke's. Matthew, on the, uh, the Olivet Discourse, has 97 verses. Mark's has 37. What would Matthew's record of our Lord's prophetic discourse look like uh, you know, without the other three? Why do people prefer Mark's condensed account of divorce when they have Matthew's fuller accounts on other subjects and prefer them? Those are all just little thoughts to keep you thinking while we're going along here. And we're going to be making some closing remarks, illustrations, and bringing this study to a close. Suffice it to say this before we move on. One clear statement in God's Word pertaining to morality, right and wrong, in either testament, old or new, is sufficient to settle any question. Let me say that again. One clear statement in God's word 
is sufficient to settle any question. Jesus proved the resurrection of the dead to the Sadducees from, by an inference from a single text. One exception disproves a hypothesis with just as much scientific certainty as a thousand. Some people uh, have said things like, well, I've never heard that teaching before. Why is this teaching so new? Uh, people used to didn't believe that. Well, I hate to break the news to you, but I proved to you on these tapes it's not new. I've given you quotes from as far back as 185 A.D., right on down through the 14, 15, 16, 1700 of some of the greatest preachers and Bible scholar teachers, men of God that's ever lived, that teach divorce and remarriage at least 97% like I've taught it to you on these tapes. Now, just because we, some of us Mountain Baptists, have grew up thinking that Sunday's the Sabbath and we've accepted Catholic teachings on divorce and remarriage doesn't mean anything. How many times have you ever been to a Baptist church in the, this part of the country and heard them stand up and pray, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day? And then all of a sudden we find out that Saturday was a Sabbath and they started preaching it and some of the old timers look at you like you're crazy and still do. Now just because you've never heard something before don't mean it's wrong. And just because you've never heard something taught before doesn't mean the church in general didn't believe it hundreds of years before you were born. And you better be um, careful and pray about it before you accept something just because you've heard it all your life and not accept what the Bible says. Now, I know, I know what the problem with some of you preachers are. And God bless you, I love you. And I want, I want to help you because you've sure helped me. And if I'm wrong, I want a man to stand up and skin my hide and tell me about it. I'd rather get it settled now and get it right now than have to face God at the judgment with it one of these days. And I know what some of you preachers' problem is. I've seen it. I've been around to enough preachers' fellowships and meetings so I know what the problem is. You're compromisers. You know deep down in your heart that what you've heard on these tapes is the truth, but you're scared of the brethren. And you just as well be in a, in a denominational church that tells you what to do as scared to death of your preacher brethren, afraid to believe anything different than they do, but afraid they'll ostracize you and throw you out of the group or maybe not invite you over to their church to preach revivals no more. Great day, brother. If God can't open the door, what good is going anyway? Uh, don't be scared of the brethren. Uh, don't be a smart aleck, and I'm not trying to be. And I know good men that, I, that disagree with me on this, and we still have fellowship, and I preach for them, and they preach for me, and we work together to try to get souls saved. And I don't think that everybody has to agree with me, but I think it's very, I think you're a compromiser if you know the truth and won't preach it just because you're afraid of what the brethren is going to say about you. Now, the truth is, a man can, could shack up with a woman for two years, make vows to her, whatever he wanted to do, and then split up, and then get saved and get called to preach, and everybody would pray for him a good Christian wife, and he'd go far in the ministry. But if that same fella had been decent when he was lost and married a girl and then she had run off with another man and divorced him and he got saved, he's told he can never preach or can never get married again. That ain't going to work. That just won't work. Common sense and the Bible and the witness of the Holy Ghost tells you that's not right. Now, uh, you better pray about that a long time before you start offending one of these little ones that just get saved and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's amazing, as I said earlier on the tape, how some preachers say that Matthew 5.32 is only to the Jews and has nothing to do with Gentiles. And then back up about six verses later and get on verse 28 and preach it to their blue in the face. It's the same thing as Deuteronomy 24. 
And I realize, doctrinally speaking, what Deuteronomy 24 is about. But you watch it. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm trying to make a point. You watch them preach Deuteronomy 24 and say that has nothing to do with us because that's just Moses talking to Jews. And then back up two chapters later and get Deuteronomy 22, 5 and preach it to the Gentile Christian. Uh, I'm, I'm, I think... Uh, I think everybody ought to do right. I think women ought to dress like uh, decent Christian women, and the New Testament covers it. Uh, it tells them to dress modestly. I don't believe in immodest dress. I don't believe in uh, showing your nudity in public and flaunting your flesh or anything like that. But I don't believe in just twisting the Bible up to try to prove what you want to preach and twisting the Bible and taking it out of context to back up something that you believe either. And I'll tell you another thing. I think some people have a problem with this divorce and remarriage thing because they're miserable in their marriage but and really down deep inside they'd give anything to have another one and resent the people who do because as the book of Peter tells us they have eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. And I have no one in mind when I say that. I'm not condemning or judging anybody. I've just observed that down through the years. I'm just giving you some comments and closing that I've uh, just kind of picked up as I went along. I've noticed some people talk about it so much it must be bothering them real bad. It's just like immodest dress and clothing on women. If a guy talks about that every time he opens his mouth, there's something wrong somewhere, brother. Uh, if a man talks about it every time he speaks... Uh, he may have a problem with it. He needs to get right with God. There's a lot more in that book besides that. I've heard, I've heard excuses like, yeah, if you teach that, everybody will get divorced in the trend and so on and so forth. Uh, but just because someone takes advantage of the Lord's divorce rule doesn't mean it's not right. And the same thing applies for eternal security. Some people say, oh, well, I'm saved. I can live like the devil. Now, you know that's not right. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Just because a man takes advantage of a truth doesn't change the truth. Just because a man takes advantage of what God said about divorce and remarriage doesn't change the truth of what God said about divorce and remarriage. Our position is plain. A divorced man for fornication is free. He's free according to Deuteronomy 24. He's free according to Matthew chapter 19 and Matthew chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 27 and 28. He is free. He is single. He is not married. And if he did get married, it would not be adultery and he would not be the husband of two wives. You say, well, that's the way we look at it. What about the way in the eyes of God? We're not even concerned about how we look at it. That's all I'm interested in is how does God look at it. You know how God looks at it? He looks at it like he said he did in his word. That's the way God looks at it. I heard one man said this. One man said that a divorced man can't pastor in my position, for example, because he doesn't have a wife and a bishop has to be the husband of one wife. And a man told a pr one preacher that I knew of, this has been years ago, he said, you can't pastor a church because you're divorced and you've got to be the husband of one wife. So the guy said, okay, I'll get married and then I'll be the husband of one wife. He said, no, you can't do that because you'd have two. You mean zero and one equals two? You mean a guy can't pastor a church if he's divorced because he don't have a wife and if he gets a wife he'll have two wives? With all due respect to great men, brother, that is ridiculous. As I said before, it's the church's business. They know a man. They know his life. They know who they want to be their pastor. You can't fool them people sitting out there in the pew. They've watched a man for years and years and years and years and years. They check him out by the book. They pray. Uh, yeah, there's some folks out there that, that got some discernment and if that church chooses that man to be their pastor and according to the book he meets their qualification then it's none of mine or yours or no one else's business. We're not Catholics. 
These are, this is an independent Baptist churches we're talking to mostly and about, although I realize other groups will get a hold of these tapes and hope it'll be a blessing to you. And even if you are in a denomination, you should be independent in the sense that you operate the way God wants you to operate. Now let me show you another thing as we're just making these closing comments that uh, the Lord showed me some time back. I was studying about this thing about the husband of one wife and the Lord said, just keep a reading there a little bit. And I read over there in 1 Timothy chapter 4 about in the latter times, that's the last days, that people would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And one of the things they'd be doing would be forbidding people to get married. And you know, I begin to look at that and I think, Lord, that's what's going on in a lot of our fundamental Bible-believing circles. People are forbidding Christian people to get married and putting heavy burdens on them that God Almighty never intended to be on them. And I said, God, show me what that means for absolute, positively sure. Give me some more proof about that husband of one wife. I had never read this in a book, what I'm getting ready to show you right now. I just said, Lord, give me something. And I was getting ready to go to Michigan, preach revival, and I had to go catch an airplane, and I was praying and studying about this because some people had asked me a lot of questions about it. And I read 1 Timothy 3, and I read 1 Timothy 4, and I read 1 Timothy 5. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, there's some scripture talking about the church supporting widows. And the church in those days took widows and, and supported them because they didn't have a husband. Their husband had died, you know, and a lot of them didn't have families. And the ones that didn't have families, the church would support them. But there was a qualification that a widow had, uh, certain qualifications that she had to be to get support from the church, and one of them was to be a widow indeed. And that widow indeed there in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, meant that she would trust it in God and she continued in supplications and prayers night and day. Boy, that'd get rid of most of them right there, wouldn't it? But anyway, it said that, that she should be blameless and uh, uh, not live in pleasure and that she should not be under 60 years old having been the wife of one man. And I said, now, what does that mean? Having been the wife of one man. There's that phrase just like 1 Timothy 3. Husband of one wife, there it is. Wife of one man. And I thought, does that mean that if a woman had a husband, listen carefully now, I'll show you what the Lord showed me. Does that mean if a woman had a husband and she got married when she was 20 years old and on their wedding night her husband was killed in an accident, that if she ever remarried from the time she was 20 till the time she was 60 and she was a widow and didn't have no family to take care of, that the church wouldn't support her? Of course not. That wife of one man would mean if that husband died and she got married again, she was still the wife of one man. So the term wife of one man means married to one woman. So the term in 1 Timothy 3, husband of one wife, means married to one woman and you know i said glory to god i thank you for that lord that morning listen to this that morning i said thank you lord for showing me that i got on the airplane i went to michigan i walked in the pastor's house he said here i picked up this book somewhere i thought you might enjoy reading it and it was a great, a thick book on divorce and remarriage. And I said, Lord, I've read enough about that, but I'll look at it. I took it upstairs to my room. I flipped it open about halfway through the book, looked down, 
and it was dealing with this scripture on 1 Timothy 5 and told me exactly what I just got through telling you about this woman being the wife of one man. And it was just like the Holy Ghost said, there it is, son. And I said, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. It's just, you know, I appreciate the Lord doing stuff like that. He seemed like he's always done stuff like that for me. And I praise him so much for it. And you say, oh, God didn't show you that. Well, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. But I've seen the Lord do that so many times with so many different things. And it all boils down to this. Do you want the truth? Do you want the truth? There's a man told me about 1982. He said, Danny, if you keep believing that, he said, it'll ruin you. He said, he said, you got the makings of a great preacher, and if you ruin that, you'll if you believe that, you'll never get have nothing to do. And I won't have no ministry. Good night, here it is, 1990, and and I'm I've, I've got more to do than I can do. Uh, we had um, I think we had 675 yesterday morning in Sunday school, and over 700 for preaching, and I've got revival meetings scheduled out all this spring and summer, and part of the fall, and and got young people to deal with at our youth camp all summer and I tell you man I, I've got more to do than I'll ever get done I'm, I'm just bragging on the Lord hallelujah to God be the glory but I'm just telling you this if God wants a man in the ministry you're not going to take him out and if God don't want a man in you can push him and print up flyers for him and recommend him in newspapers and put his name all over the country and if God don't want him in he ain't in but if God does want him in, you can cut him down, criticize him, lie about him, misrepresent him, talk to, talk to people that like him and do everything you want to, and God's just going to keep right on blessing and using him. That's up to God. God uses who he chooses, and I've observed that down through the years. All right, let me give you some more conclusions, and I hope you understand why I said what I just got through saying. I'm not bragging by anything, by any means. I'm the least of God's young'uns and don't even deserve to be called a Christian. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I'm raising my three kids, and God's been good to me. My two oldest daughters are saved. My youngest daughter, um, who will be three in May of 1990, uh, is, is safe in the arms of Jesus. My five-year-old just trusted the Lord the other, uh, the other night. Uh, she asked me to pray with her, and I, I prayed with her, and she trusted the Lord to save her soul. And God's been mighty, mighty good to me. And I've got no complaints. I'm not bitter. I just thank God for his blessings. And if the Lord wants to use me as a, an example of this, or a guinea pig or whatever he wants to, to help divorce people, to give them hope and Tell them there is life after divorce and tell them that God's not through with you and not to hang it up and not to listen to people that tell you you can't never be right. Uh, then that's God's business, brother. And if the Lord wants me to just preach to second-class people, that's his business. I'm willing to do what God wants me to do. To God be the glory. Now, as I begin to come down to the conclusion, I state the same question that I ask you at the very beginning. If a man is divorced from his ex-wife scripturally, legally, physically, are they still married? The answer, of course, from the Bible, no. The answer, of course, from common sense, no. The answer, of course, from church history, no. The answer, of course, from the preaching of the Word of God as it stands, no. I have four basic reasons for my position on divorce and remarriage. Number one is the Scriptures themselves. As far as I'm concerned, if that book says it, it's settled forever in heaven. I may not live up to all of it, and I've sinned and come short of the glory of God, but I'll tell you one thing, brother, I believe it. And if that's what the book says, then that's what it means as far as I'm concerned. And the scripture teaches what I taught you on these tapes. 
The second reason I have for my position is common sense. It does not make a lick of sense, as they say out in the country, don't make a lick of sense to command a person who's been through an unfortunate married marriage to remain single the rest of their life and allow a person who's shacked up with five different people to get married. It's against common sense. Number three is church history. And I've gave you quotes from 185 A.D. all the way up to the present time from some of the greatest figures in church history that support this position. And number four, the fourth basic reason I have for my position is there is evidence of the blessing of God upon many, many of God's people who are in their second marriage. And if they were living in sin, I can't see God Almighty using them to win souls. I don't know anybody that's living in sin that wins souls. I don't know anybody that's shacking up living in adultery that's winning souls. Do you? You know, there's a one preacher friend of mine. It was kind of it was kind of strange in a way, but it was very interesting. Uh, he had been through a divorce before he ever got saved, and uh, the Lord saved him, and he's doing a great work for God now, and he's got a wonderful wife, and he come and preached at our church one night, and I mean to tell you, the glory fell. We shouted. These people jumped up and down, screamed. We had the awfulest service ever was. People were crying, getting right with God. I mean, it was so foggy in there. As Brother Mays said, you'd have to get a C&I dog to get out of that place. And there were a lot of preachers there that night. And those preachers swarmed around that preacher after he got through preaching. And they started trying to book him for meetings and saying, Praise God, God's hands on this man. God's all over this man. God had used him. The Holy Ghost was in that place. You wouldn't believe it. And they didn't know he had, he had been divorced and remarried. And so uh, I think he took some of them into a little side room and went ahead and told them because he figured what the reaction would be. And then suddenly they decided that he wasn't even called to preach and that he shouldn't be in the pulpit and cancel their meetings. You know, I've often wondered how a guy felt, how that, a preacher would feel like that driving home. Wouldn't you feel like an idiot if you jumped on a guy and thought the Holy Ghost was using him and come to find out that he ain't even supposed to be preaching and it wasn't the Holy Ghost? Well, I don't know if you ought to make that mistake or not. When God's hands on somebody and God's using them, you know, uh, maybe you're wrong. You ever thought about that? There's an evidence of the blessing of God upon many people who are doing a work for God Almighty that are in their second marriage. I'm not for divorce. I'm not condoning it. I'm sorry it happened. But you cannot deny that some of the best bus workers, Sunday school teachers, and yes, preachers and deacons that you'll ever hear, hear preach have been through an unfortunate marriage, marriage and God's still blessing them like crazy. Now, I can hear some of you probably saying, well, Brother Danny, I don't know if I agree with you or not, but you have got me to thinking. And I just wonder, you might say, how you know you've got the right interpretation of Scripture. Well, I'm going to give you eight rules of interpretation, and these will work in law court. They'll work anywhere and study in the Word of God. And uh, some of the most brilliant minds on the Bible that's ever been approached the Bible just like they would the law of the land. Uh, some of the greatest preachers have, were even uh, lawyers before they were saved. And the Apostle Paul himself had a great knowledge of the law and used it as he wrote the scriptures that God gave him. So I'm going to give you eight rules of interpretation, and then we'll make some more closing uh, comments before we get through. Number one... This is from quote from uh, a preacher by the name of Guy Duty, who's gone home to be with the Lord now. He studied the subject of divorce and remarriage for something like 20 years, and he uh, wrote one of the greatest books on divorce and remarriage I've ever seen. 
And the name of the book is Divorce and Remarriage by Guy Duty. If you can ever get a hold of that book, it, it's probably the greatest. I didn't even know the man of God, but he's dead and gone now. But God used him to really clear up a lot of things on this subject. And he gives eight rules of interpretation. This is not just for divorce and remarriage, for anything. Number one is the rule of definition. What he's saying is, anytime you study the scripture, you've got to study definition of words. You've got to define your terms and then keep to the terms defined. You can't let a word mean one thing one place and another thing another place and, and uh, you've got to give it the Bible definition of that word and consistently abide by the plain meaning of the word. Now the Bible writers couldn't make up new words so that they would not be understood and they were forced to use those words that were already in use. And so uh, a person, according to Young's Analytical Concordance, the author confines the definition strictly to their literal or idiomatic force, which, after all, will be found to form the best and indeed the only safe and solid basis for theological deductions of any kind. That's the rule of definition. Number two, the rule of usage. The whole Bible may, regard it, may be regarded, of course, as written for the Jew first, and its words and idioms ought to be rendered according to Hebrew usage. Jesus Christ accepted the usage he found in existence. He didn't take the Old Testament that had been around for thousands of years and then suddenly give all the words a new definition in the book of Matthew. In interpreting any, many phrases and histories of the New Testament, it is not so much worth what we think of them, of notions of our own, as in what sense these things were understood by the hearers and lookers-on according to the usual, usual custom and vulgar dialect of the nation. In other words, in the time of Jesus, if a man said fornication, nobody in the audience would think he's talking about premarital sin only. Number three, the rule of context. Many a passage of Scripture will not be understood at all without the help of the context. For a lot of times, one sentence derives all its point and force from the connection of the context in which it stands. Bible words must be understood according to the requirements of the context. Every word you read must be understood in the light of the words that come before and after it. Bible words, when used out of context, can prove almost anything twist them, uh, some interpreters do, from a natural to a non-natural sense, and therefore you can prove anything you want to if you take scripture out of context. Number four, the rule of historical background. Even a general reader of the Word of God must be aware that some knowledge of Jewish life and society at the time is a prerequisite for the understanding of the gospel history. And once the student has in his mind what was in the mind of the author or authors in the biblical books when these were written, he's got the thought of the scripture. Theological interpretation and historical investigation can never be separated one from another. The strictest historical scrutiny is an indispensable discipline to all Bible theology. Number five. The rule of logic. Interpretation is merely logical reasoning. The use of reason in the interpretation of Scripture is everywhere to be assumed. The Bible comes to us in the forms of human language and appeals to our reason. It invites investigation, and it is to be interpreted as we interpret any other volume by a rigid application of the same laws of language and the same grammatical analysis. That means you don't get down and see, be starry-eyed and see some vision and God show you a meaning of a scripture that doesn't follow the rule of logic. I mean, you don't see an angel float down out of the sky and tell you something that's not backed up by the rest of the Word of God. 
It is one of the most firmly established principles of law that a law means exactly what it says, like go and be another man's wife, like except for fornication, like the husband of one wife. It means exactly what it says and is to be interpreted and enforced exactly as it reads. Charles Finney was a lawyer and I think before he was saved, and of course he was a great theologian also. He's widely considered as one of the greatest theologians and revivalists since the apostolic time. He was often in sharp conflict with the theologians of his days because they violated the rules of interpretation. Finney said he interpreted a Bible passage as he would have understood the same or like passage in a law book. He stressed the need for definition and logic in theology and said the Bible must be understood on fair principles interpretation such as would be admitted in a court of justice. And that's what we've tried to do on these tapes. We've tried to give you fair documented evidence so that if we had to go to court and prove this case, we could submit enough evidence to prove our point in front of a judge. Rule number six, and that's the rule of precedent. You must not violate the known usage of a word, like fornication all the way through the Old Testament, and then suddenly invent another for which there is no precedent. That comes from the Greek New Testament for English readers. And the professional ability of lawyers in arguing a question of law and the judges in deciding it is chiefly occupied with a critical study of previous cases in order to determine whether the previous cases really support some alleged doctrine. The first thing a judge does was to compare the case before him with precedence. Number seven, the rule of unity. It is fundamental to a true interpretation of Scripture that the parts of a document, law, or instrument are to be construed with reference to the significance of the whole. Where a transaction is carried out by means of several documents so that together they form part of a single whole, these documents are read together as one. That's the rule of unity. And the, the way I've taught divorce and remarriage, the scriptures have unity. They don't contradict each other. You don't have to leave any of the scriptures out. They're all there. And then finally, number eight, the rule of inference. In the law of evidence, an inference is a fact reasonably implied from another fact. It is a logical consequence. It is a process of reasoning. It derives a conclusion from a given fact or premise. It is the production, deduction, of one proposition from another proposition. It is a conclusion drawn from evidence. You hear that? It is a conclusion drawn from evidence. An inferential fact or proposition, although not expressly stated, is sufficient to bind. This principle of interpretation is upheld by law courts. And that is the eight rules of interpretation that we need to go by. It wouldn't hurt us to apply them to all of our teaching and our doctrine. Now here we come to the end of the first side of this last tape. On the reverse side of this last tape, we will give you our conclusion and our final closing remarks on the, on the study of marriage, divorce, and remarriage.